Hello everyone, I'm Raccoon. Today I'm bringing Heavenly Delusion, a must-see anime in April. An endless wall divides the world into two parts. The walled part is called heaven, where people live a happy and peaceful life. While the outside part is called hell, which is already in ruins, and countless hideous monsters would come out to hunt humans late at night. Here humans even slaughter each other in order to survive. The story begins in heaven inside the wall, where a girl named Mimiheim tells a boy named Tokyo that there will be a school exam today. Tokyo doesn't believe her words, because usually the school will notify them in advance of the exam. Unexpectedly, the next moment the school notifies that a temporary exam will be held. During the exam, Tokyo sees a strange question on the screen. It says, do you want to go outside? The question flashes by, and Tokyo thought he misread it. As the exam is over, Tokyo wonders how Mimiheim knew the exam time in advance, and she indicates that it was just her premonition. Tokyo then tells her about the weird question he saw in the exam. Hearing it, Mimiheim takes Tokyo to the wall saying that she has been having a hunch that there is another world outside the wall. Recently, when she thinks about it, two figures will appear in her mind with one of them looking exactly like Tokyo. Tokyo grew up here, and he takes the walled area as the whole world. But after listening to what Mimiheim said, he falls into deep thought, and even suffers insomnia at night. So he comes to the wall again, only to be found by the principal. Tokyo asks the question out of curiosity, is there really another world outside the wall? The principal thinks that Tokyo will know the truth sooner or later, so she tells Tokyo that there is indeed a world outside the wall, but it's just a filthy world with many ugly monsters. The scene then switches to the outside world. Fifteen years ago, an unprecedented catastrophe hit the world, leaving it devastated. A pair of siblings walk through the street. The older sister is named Kiriko and the younger brother is named Maru. From their conversation, we know that they are looking for heaven, but they don't know where it is exactly. Surprisingly, the brother Maru looks very similar to Tokyo. The siblings haven't eaten for days, so when they find a house with a well-locked door, they expect to find some supplies inside. Sure enough, they found complete toilet paper after entering the house through the window, and Kiriko happily pulls the weeds off the toilet. She has not used the toilet for a long time. It's just that the bathroom door is broken, so Maru accidentally sees Kiriko on the toilet, which makes her angry. The two then continue to explore the house hoping to find some food, only to see skeletons of a couple, who died with their hands clasped. It seems the two were starving to death, which means there is no food in the house. Fortunately, they soon find some cans in another house, and although Kiriko isn't good at cooking, they get something into their stomach. The next day, not long after setting out, they encounter a group of ruffians. In a world without legal restrictions, girls will be very miserable if they are caught by them. Maru immediately fights with these ruffians, and it can be seen that he is skilled and agile as the several ruffians are no match for him. Just then, Kiriko takes out a special pistol and fires a laser beam, which directly melts the telegraph pole on the side. Seeing this, the ruffians immediately raise their hands and surrender. Kiriko inquires about heaven from them, getting to know about a place full of tomatoes, which is called heaven by tomato lovers, and Kiriko decides to visit that place. Then Kiriko threatens the ruffians to hand over a battery, and when they see Kiriko put the battery into the bottom of the pistol, they realize the pistol just had the energy replenished. Though angry, they can only watch Kiriko and Maru leave. On their way, Kiriko and Maru talk about their age. Maru says he is 15 years old, while Kiriko isn't sure about her age, just saying she's around 20. Soon after, they stumble upon a hotel still in operation. In a collapsed world, money is useless, so Kiriko gives some batteries to the hostess to show gratitude for her taking them in. Kiriko then asks if the hostess has any information about heaven, along with showing a picture of two men, hoping to know their whereabouts as the two men are important to Kiriko. However, the hostess knows nothing about the men or heaven. Kiriko is not disappointed about the answer, just taking Maru into the room and they are finally able to take a hot bath. Strangely, when Kiriko sees herself naked body full of scars in the mirror, she looks a bit shy. Later, in the chat with the hostess, they learn that there will be dangerous monsters appearing at night. Instead of being scared, Kiriko shows some excitement, saying that she has a special pistol that can shoot monsters, only to see a sudden gloomy expression on the hostess's face. But soon she returns to normal and prepares dinner for them. During the meal, the hostess reminds Maru and Kiriko that it is not a good thing for siblings to have a child. The two immediately blush, and Kiriko quickly explains that she and Maru are not siblings, let alone she has no interest in him, and that she is just a bodyguard Maru hired in Tokyo. As the misunderstanding is cleared up, Kiriko and Maru go back to their room to rest. Maru is a little upset to know Kiriko doesn't have an interest in him. It seems he has a crush on Kiriko. Seeing how Maru reacts to what she said, Kiriko tries to comfort him, only to fall into a coma before she can say a word. It turns out that the hostess has added a lot of sleeping pills to the food they ate. Meanwhile, we see the hostess pick up a shotgun, and a terrifying giant strange bird flies toward the hotel. When Kiriko finally wakes up, she finds a man eating monster outside the window, and she quickly awakens Maru. The two walk out of the room with weapons, and drink some water to dilute the sleeping pills in their bodies. 
Just then, the hostess discovers them, asking them to go back. Kiriko guesses that the hostess was trying to keep them away from the monster so she added the sleeping pills to their food. At this moment, the giant bird shows up again. Kiriko and Maru quickly chase after it. This huge monster looks very terrifying. It has no head, but a very sharp whip that can easily cut through a human body. Experienced in combat, Kiriko and Maru soon keep the monster at disadvantage. Just as Kiriko is about to give it a fatal shot, the hostess blocks the way and shouts, This is my child. It turns out that the monster ate the son of the hostess not long ago, and she thought since her son had entered the bird's body, the bird is her son now. She tells Kiriko and Maru that the strange bird will not harm her and even helped her drive away other monsters not long ago. Just when Kiriko believes what the hostess said and puts down her weapon, the monster directly cuts off the hostess with its whip, and then eats her. This scene enrages the two. Maru wipes Kiriko's tears, and then rushes to the monster using all his strength to penetrate his arm into its body, directly crumbing its heart. It seems that Maru has the power unimaginable to ordinary people. As the battle ends, Kiriko and Maru continue on their way early the next morning. They lament that maybe the hostess was telling the truth. The monster indeed inherited her son's personality in the beginning and protected her several times. It's just that it is a monster after all. And in the end, it would still hunt and eat people everywhere with the humanity destroyed. Otherwise, the world would not fall into such a terrifying situation. They don't feel like discussing this topic, while just following the clues given by the ruffians to find heaven. After a long journey, they discover a farmland, which they speculate to be the heaven full of tomatoes. Just then, Kiriko asks Maru what his purpose is in going to heaven. Maru takes out a bottle, and according to him, someone asked him to go to heaven to find the one who looks exactly like him, and then inject the medicine in the bottle into his body, so that he can save many people. Hearing this, Kiriko is caught in a memory where a severely injured woman begged her to escort Maru to heaven. They are then discovered by the nearby farmers, who treat them warmly as children. From the locals, they get to know that after the catastrophe, villagers here rebuilt their homeland, first planting a lot of tomatoes and later other crops. Perhaps that's why it was called a heaven of tomatoes. As villagers here never show any surprise when they see Maru, Kiriko believes there's nobody looking like him, thus it is not the heaven Maru is looking for. Figuring it out, the two are a little frustrated. Suddenly, Maru sees a box with a mark on it, and the mark appears to be the same as the one on Kiriko's pistol. They then speculate that the special pistol should not be a product of this world, but may be related to the mysterious heaven. The two wonder how the box came about, but the villager only knows it was used to hold supplies when trading with Tokyo. As they can't find a clue to heaven, they decide to go back to Tokyo by sea. On the boat, Maru laments that since heaven cannot be found at all, he would like to farm with Kiriko for the rest of his life. Maru then plucks up the courage to confess his feelings to Kiriko and kisses her. Kiriko struggles to push Maru away, and she then reveals her secret to Maru seriously. Although her body is a woman, her brain belongs to a man, so she is a man indeed. Her words seem to be unbelievable, but it is the truth. As Kiriko starts to reveal her past, we are brought back to five years ago. Ten years had passed after the catastrophe, and humans had gradually adapted to the existence of man-eating monsters, beginning to rebuild their homes. The siblings Kiriko and Haruki lost their parents, becoming orphans. They then found a human community, moved into the orphanage here, and lived by working in the electro kart racing industry. Kiriko was a racer and would regularly compete in various races, supporting the children in the orphanage and her brother with her bonus. To keep the race running, the head of the racing association hired many orphans as security guards, and Haruki was one of them. One day, two gangsters were found sneaking into the arena with forged tickets, and Haruki was knocked down by the two gangsters when he tried to arrest them. After the catastrophe, it is difficult for the laws of this world to bind mankind. When the two gangsters were about to kill Haruki, a man named Robin appeared in time to save him and defeat the gangsters. After that, Robin told Haruki that when fighting, he couldn't just stare at the enemy but must observe his surroundings and use all the tools at his disposal. He then left the credit of catching two gangsters to Haruki, who could thus receive the reward. Robin was a bit older than Haruki, and often took care of him as well as the other kids in the orphanage. Therefore, Haruki admired him a lot. Getting the reward, Haruki happily returned to the orphanage, where there were some orphans about his age, and while they were chit-chatting, Kiriko returned from a race, as she accidentally broke her arm. A bearded doctor followed her back, after Kiriko went to have a rest, a kid at the scene secretly told Haruki that he had better not let Kiriko get too close to the doctor, who was said to be secretly studying man-eating monsters and conducting human experiments, according to Robin's investigation. At night, while Haruki was sleeping, he noticed that Kiriko was cold and asked her to sleep with him. When Kiriko actually did this, Haruki was a little shy. At this moment, there was a noise downstairs. It turned out that a man-eating monster was found in this neighborhood, and a group of men were about to fight it. Haruki also followed with a gun made by himself. The scene then switches to Haruki training his gun shooting skills. It turned out the man-eater had been eliminated, but Robin was so angry at Haruki joining the fight. He lost his sister who was at Haruki's age when the catastrophe had just occurred, so he would pay extra attention and care to Haruki, 
hoping to keep him safe. Just then, Haruki noticed that it was almost 3 o'clock, and he hurried to watch his sister's race. To observe the racetrack better, he took out his binoculars to watch the game, only to find a transparent man-eater appearing at the end of the track. He was going to shout for help, but the race had started, and the cheers of the people at the scene were so loud that nobody could hear his voice. Thinking that it would just take his sister a few minutes to reach the end line, he knew it was too late to inform others. So he took his gun, rushing to the place where the monster appeared. When encountering the monster, he shot it fiercely, only to find the strong defense man-eater unharmed. The brave boy then took out his dagger and rushed at the monster. However, not only did he not hurt the monster, but he was entangled by it and could not break free. After a few minutes, Kiriko arrived at the end track, where she noticed a man-eating monster. She quickly stopped and notified the racer behind to call for help. As she was about to leave, she saw Haruki being held in the mouth of the monster. Kiriko collapsed instantly. She shouted Haruki's name, drove her cart into the monster, and snatched Haruki's body from the monster. Perhaps the monster was full, so it didn't attack her and left. Sadly, only half of Haruki's body remained. Thinking that her brother would soon die, Kiriko's mind was filled with their past, and her tears couldn't stop flowing. At this moment, the scene switches. It seems that someone was performing surgery on Haruki. He felt that he was in a nightmare, where his beloved sister has gone, while he was entangled by the man-eater. By the time Haruki finally woke up, he was in the hospital bed. He dragged his tired body out of the ward. When he saw his look in the mirror, he instantly went out of control. He couldn't believe he had changed into Kiriko, shouting that he wanted to see his sister. The doctors quickly stepped forward to inject him with tranquilizers. The nurses thought that Kiriko couldn't accept the loss of her brother, and thus believed herself to be Haruki. At this moment, Haruki had calmed down, and he asked them what happened after he fell into a coma. The nurses revealed to Kiriko, who was actually Haruki, that when she and her brother were sent to the hospital, they were both dying. It was the bearded doctor who conducted the operation, bringing her back to life, but unfortunately, her brother died, and the doctor left after the surgery. Haruki was a little confused. He remembered seeing his sister crying but surely alive before he fell into a coma. How could she be sent to the hospital with him? Haruki knew that nobody would believe that he was in his sister's body, but he was sure he must be Haruki, because he grieved the loss of his sister, and occasionally rejoiced in inheriting his sister's body late at night. His feelings for his sister seemed to be very special. Haruki decided to keep this secret to himself, and four months had passed by the time he fully recovered. Then, he intended to leave the hospital to find the truth about this matter. He remembered what an orphan had mentioned to him that Robin was investigating the identity of the bearded doctor. So he planned to go to Robin to see if he could get any clues. He went back to the electro kart racing place where he had worked, only to be told by the staff there that Robin might have been killed. It turned out that there had been frequent disappearances in the neighborhood recently, and Robin had also disappeared while investigating the issue. Haruki hurried back to the orphanage where he used to live, only to find that his companions had also left. A man living nearby told him the kids had lost their financial resources after Kiriko and Robin left, so they had to move somewhere else, but no one knew exactly where they moved to. Disappointed, Haruki walked back to his room, lay on the bed, and shed tears. At this moment, Haruki thought of a key point. People here did not find Robin's body, and there was no definitive evidence that Robin was dead. Maybe Robin just went somewhere else. He believed that if he could find Robin or the doctor, he would know the truth. Therefore, he found pictures of the two, and changed his name to Kiriko. He presented himself as a bodyguard, protecting his employers while following them everywhere to find Robin and the doctor. Four years passed by like this until Kiriko met Maru. Kiriko's incredible past shocks Maru, but in a world full of monsters, nothing is impossible. So Maru believes what Kiriko says, it's just that he doesn't know if he should still call Kiriko sister. Just as they're still troubled by how to appropriately call each other, a scream comes from a man nearby. Kiriko and Maru run over to check and are taken aback. A terrifying man-eating fish monster appears outside the boat. At this time, the scene switches to heaven, where a boy named Kona is painting a baby with a strange face. A girl likes the painting so much, praising his painting to be weird but good and asking if he can give this painting to her. Kona is confused, not knowing why his painting is weird. Just then, Tokyo appears and takes the girl away. Tokyo tells the girl not to always find fault with Kona's paintings, while the girl retorts that she was praising him and that she has seen real babies. They have no faces. Curious, Tokyo follows the girl named Kuku outside, and she tells Tokyo to follow her if he wants to see the baby without a face. Seeing Tokyo nod, Kuku takes Tokyo under the high wall, and then jumps onto the wall. Her limbs can stick to any object, and she climbs up to a vent on the wall with his superpower. Tokyo also wants to climb the high wall, but unfortunately, he does not have the superpower, so he can only find a way to keep up with Kuku. At the same time, the cameras in heaven are monitoring everything about the children. It is soon revealed from the conversation between the two staff members in the monitoring room that there are cameras everywhere in the heaven, and everything about the children cannot escape their notice. People here are studying the movements and behaviors of these children, and these children are their experiments. 
Seeing two children hugging and kissing, they think it is very interesting because they have never taught these children about love. At this moment, Tokyo finds a machine, and taking advantage of the fact that the machine can move against the wall, he steps on the machine and ascends. Strangely, the monitor is already focusing on Tokyo, but he can't be seen on the monitoring screen. Soon, Tokyo follows Cuckoo through the ventilation duct to a laboratory. There are many experimental containers with many strange babies inside. They have no face, and some strange tentacles grow on the lower part of their bodies. When one of the babies sees Tokyo, he makes a gesture of embrace. Tokyo approaches the baby curiously, and just then, an alarm-telling intruder detected sounds in the room. Cuckoo quickly jumps on the ventilation duct, but Tokyo does not have the same bounce as Cuckoo, and he is so frightened that he stands still. At this moment, after hearing the alarm, the staff member sends someone to see where the intrusion has occurred. However, just like not long ago, Tokyo doesn't show up on the monitoring screen. Right now Tokyo is still in a daze, and Cuckoo hurriedly shouts out his name and flees with him holding his hand. After they leave, the baby who interacted with Tokyo just now whispers, Tokyo, it seems that this strange baby remembers Tokyo. Next, the scene jumps to the principal's side. There is a robot named Mina next to the principal, and her body connects everything in the heaven. From their conversation, we can know that the heaven is like Mina's body, and she can feel everything in the heaven. But even she can't notice that Tokyo intrudes. So in the end, the principal can only take the alarm just now as a mistake. Now, let's finish the story in the heaven and jump to Kiriko and Maru's side. Kiriko discovers a giant fish that eats humans on the ship. This strange fish has an ability similar to Cuckoo's, with many human arms on its body, and it can move quickly with its arms sticking to the wall. Besides, it will spit water arrows to attack humans. The most frightening thing is that it is covered in a strange film of water, and even Kiriko's pistol cannot hurt it. Kiriko and the others can only temporarily retreat into the ship, and they learn from the captain that the ship won't reach the shore until at least 30 minutes later. But if this strange fish keeps attacking the ship, the hull is likely to be destroyed. Through the observation just now, Kiriko finds that the strange fish relies on the water film on its body to stick to the wall and defend itself. So she thinks of a very dangerous way to deal with it. That is, to lead the fish to the ship and fight it. Before Maru can understand Kiriko's plan, Kiriko has already run to the deck to attract the fish's attention. When the fish is attracted, she and Maru desperately escape, leading the fish to a place in the cabin where the goods are stacked. Maru tries to find an exit to flee, but Kiriko reassures Maru that he doesn't have to do that. It turns out that this cabin is filled with various cardboard boxes, which contain not only various vegetables, but also a lot of marijuana. These cardboard boxes and marijuana absorb the moisture on the strange fish, making the water film on the strange fish disappear. Therefore, the fish becomes an ordinary giant fish. After the threat is removed, Kiriko asks Maru to kill it. When Maru puts his hand on the strange fish, the strange fish's body shrinks, with the white gas emitting, and instantly loses its life. It seems that Maru has a special ability to kill the monster by touching it. Soon after, the ship docks, to thank Kiriko and Maru for killing the monster, the captain intends to give them payment. Kiriko refuses because they think they were just saving themselves. At this point, Kiriko takes out her pistol and asks the captain if he recognizes the marking on the pistol. The crew member who follows the captain observes for a while, and says that he knows the marking. As long as Kiriko and Maru keep walking along the road ahead, they can see the building related to the marking. With useful information, Kiriko and Maru set off right away. What makes them helpless is that the crew member mistook the logo of a cartoon bird in the home center for the marking on the pistol. That is to say, the clue this time is useless. But they don't end up finding nothing. Maru finds some desserts here, and they eat long-lost delicious food once again. Then, let's have a look at Tokyo's story. One day, he is reviewing his lessons in the classroom, and he notices a boy named Shiro takes Mimiheim away. Shiro takes Mimiheim to a corner where no one is, and what he says next makes Mimiheim a little puzzled. Blushed, he tells Mimiheim that every time he sees her, he will have a very special feeling in his heart, and he desires to lock her into his room, take off her clothes, and touch her body, even wanting to lick her body. Hearing this, Mimiheim is very confused, thinking that Shiro wants to eat her. Shiro hurriedly says that it is not right, but he can't make her understand his feelings. Tokyo overhears their conversation, and he is thinking about what Shiro just said. Soon after, he goes to visit a good friend who is sick, Tarao. Tarao has many dark blotches all over his body, and it seems that he is in great pain. Tokyo comforts Tarao that when he recovers, they will play together. At this time, Tarao takes Tokyo's hand, and before Tokyo can react, he approaches Tokyo and wants to kiss him on the lips. Startled, Tokyo pushes Tarao away and flees away. It seems that as these children in the heaven grow up, they gradually reveal their human emotions. Kona happens to see Tokyo running in panic, and Tokyo tells him everything that happened just now. With a sad expression on his face, he complains to Kona that everyone seems to become very strange recently, and he is afraid of these changes. Kona comforts him, saying that it is very normal for humans to fall in love with someone, and perhaps not long after. Tokyo will also have the desire to have intimate interactions with someone, which is not strange at all. 
Hearing this, Tokyo blushes and says that if it really happens, he hopes that the person is Kona. Smiling, Kona also says that he hopes Tokyo can be that person. At night, thinking of what Kona said during the day, Tokyo is so happy that he can't fall asleep. Just then, he receives urgent news that Tarao's condition suddenly deteriorates and he wants to see Tokyo. Tokyo quickly runs to Tarao's hospital room, where Tarao apologizes for forcibly kissing Tokyo previously. He did not take into account Tokyo's feelings, and he can feel that he will not live long. Seeing Tokyo worrying about him, Tarao plucks up the courage to say, Tokyo, flee away, it is very dangerous here. At this moment, Tokyo doesn't know what Tarao meant, as he is still immersed in the sadness that Tarao is about to die. Let's put aside Tokyo's story for a moment and take a look at the situation on Kiriko and Maru's side. After failing to find heaven, Kiriko and Maru rediscover a small town where humans gather, and they plan to continue to search for clues about heaven. As Kiriko and Maru are newcomers here, some gangsters want to bring them to their knees through violence. However, Maru's combat effectiveness is so strong that he knocks down several of them alone. After that, Kiriko and Maru leave for somewhere further to avoid being retaliated by the gangsters. Being safe, Kiriko then asks Maru to recall his past again to see if he has noticed some clues about heaven. Maru was born in the year of the great disaster and had been living with many children and some adults. However, when he was seven, the place they lived closed down and some children were taken away by their parents. The remaining children could only follow the older ones to live by collecting scraps. Three years later, the leader of their group was killed over some sort of turf war, while Maru and the other children were taken in by the murderer. A few more years passed by, a woman named Mikura adopted Maru and taught him how to kill monsters, and it was she who later asked Maru to find heaven. Kiriko doesn't get any useful information from Maru's story, so she plans to go out and get a map of the neighborhood to see if she can find something new. When she arrives in town, she discovers that the gangsters who they fought not long ago are looking for Maru. Just then, one of them proposes to stop looking for the kid. Instead, they should focus on the upcoming Ministry of Reconstruction. But other gangsters don't take it seriously, because the news of the imminent arrival of the Ministry of Reconstruction has been spread for a long time. The word Ministry of Reconstruction plunges Kiriko into a memory. When Kiriko was still Haruki, Robin once told him that since the Great Disaster, an organization had emerged. This organization abducted high-tech talents everywhere, hoping to use this group of talents to rebuild human society and rule the world. Surprisingly, this organization is called the Ministry of Reconstruction, and Kiriko never expects there are still rumors about it. At this moment, Kiriko has obtained the map and replenished her special pistol. She evades the gangsters and returns, only to find Maru missing. In an instant, many bad memories emerge, worrying that Maru was eaten by a monster. She gets emotional, shouting Maru's name. Just then, Maru comes over from the next room, with his face blushing. It turns out that Maru was reading some special comics next door to satisfy his physiological needs. Still badly shaken, Kiriko asks Maru not to disappear suddenly without telling her. Tears then fall from her eyes. As her family and friends have left her, she is really afraid of losing Maru. Seeing this, Maru quickly steps forward and hugs Kiriko, whispering comfort. When Kiriko finally calms down, she pulls out the map, which shows a place that has 100% safe water, and in today's world, probably only heaven has 100% safe water. Although the trip may be in vain again, they still decide to go there and take a look. Just then, the captain of the ship they took last time comes to them, proposing to hire them as the bodyguards because they showed great combat strength when defeating the fish monster. The cargo to be protected is part of the organs of the fish. It is said that there is a great doctor in an immortal order nearby, who can combine the organs of monsters with the human body to help humans obtain powerful physical bodies and even immortality. The captain wants to show off the organs he collected, only to find the organs in the bottle have turned into some sloppy pieces. As the organs have melted, the captain has no plans to look for the doctor, while Kiriko suspects that the doctor who can combine the monster's organs with the human body might be the bearded doctor she has been looking for. So she and Maru decide to go to the place to investigate. Elsewhere, one of the researchers in heaven discovers a footprint on the wall of the laboratory, realizing that someone has secretly broken in. Therefore, he begins to investigate the matter. Meanwhile, the children in heaven are singing and dancing outside Tarao's ward, hoping that Tarao can feel better hearing these cheerful music and get recovered. Unfortunately, the hopes of these kind children are doomed to be disappointing. When Tokyo wakes up the next day, he receives the news that Tarao has passed away as his disease deteriorated. Soon after, they hold a funeral for Tarao, and everyone is grieved. Just then, Tokyo asks Kona a question, did Asura also die of this disease? Hearing this, Kona suddenly becomes nervous. In his memories, Asura did not die of illness, but chose to end his life himself. But Kona does not tell Tokyo the truth, so he replies, maybe yes. When the children are mourning Tarao, the robot Mina tells the principal that the samples have been collected and Tarao's body can be cremated. Hearing this, the principal couldn't help but lament that this is the second deceased among the children. From their conversation, we learn that Tarao died of a strange disease, but Asura ended his life because he could not accept his body. 
The principal looks a little sad. Although these children are experiments, she brings them up after all. The death of children is the last thing the principal wants to see. She wonders why Jirao would get this strange disease. However, the researcher answers that they have no idea about it since they have already worked hard to make the children immune to various diseases. In other words, every child here can die of disease, which enrages the principal, who angrily orders the researcher to find out the cause before the day of fate. Later, when they cremate Jirao's body, they are shocked to see a strange black bug-like stuff in the ashes. At night, Tokyo is vomiting on the toilet. A terrible thought comes to his mind. Could it be that he is also sick? Tokyo hurriedly goes to check. Fortunately, there's nothing wrong with his body, and he is just too tired. Relieved, Tokyo goes back to bed, and that's when he notices that Asura, who should have died, suddenly appears and says, Tokyo, what is your specialty? The next moment, Tokyo's body undergoes strange and frightening changes. Suddenly, he opens his eyes with fear. It was all just a nightmare. Somewhat terrified, Tokyo sneaks out of his room and comes to Kona's room for comfort. The two begin to interact intimately, and it seems that they have secretly become a couple. We can see Tokyo's body figure, which actually has very obvious feminine characteristics. At the same time, the researcher has found out through the comparison of footprints that the person who sneaked into the laboratory was Tokyo. He just can't figure out how Tokyo could avoid the camera. Now, let's take a look at Kiriko and Maru's side. They plan to collect some water before going to the Immortal Order, so they store their luggage in a nearby guest house owned by a girl. They then approach the site marked on the map for containing 100% safe water, only to find it is just a flooded underground parking lot, and the water is not clean. Before they could figure out why it is marked as a safe water source, they discover an injured man. The man begs them to save him, saying that there's a monster here, and the next moment, the monster shows up, attacking them. The two quickly run out, while Kiriko knocks down a stone pillar with a pistol, crushing the monster's body, followed by Maru unleashing his abilities to kill the monster. However, Maru finds his ability unable to be activated, thus realizing that the beast in front of them is not a monster, but a giant bear. They quickly run up to a high platform to take refuge, where the bear can't reach. They intend to wait for the giant bear to leave, but after a long time, it is still hovering around. If they don't take another move, they'll be trapped here to death. Kiriko has to try to see if the pistol can fire a final attack, only to have the battery accidentally drop down. Knowing that her physical quality is inferior to Maru's, she proposes to let Maru touch her body if he can get the battery back. Maru was a bit scared at first, but when he hears this, he immediately rushes down and grabs the battery before the giant bear attacks. Later, with the tacit cooperation of the two, Kiriko manages to shoot the bear with the last bullet of the pistol, and the injured man is rescued by the way. When they return safely to the hotel, Kiriko recalls the accident that happened today, deducing that someone who knows about the possible appearance of the bear deliberately marked the location on the map, to lure others who want the safe water to go and be killed by the bear, so that he or she can get their supplies. In this world of the jungle, Danger is everywhere. As Kiriko analyzes the situation, Maru asks her if she has forgotten something. Then he pounces on Kiriko, trying to touch her feminine body. Just as the two are playing, the girl who ran the hotel rushes in, mistaking them for doing something intimate. Angered, she immediately tells the two to not mess around in this room, and then takes Maru to another room. Unexpectedly, this girl actually takes the initiative to try to satisfy Maru. It turns out that in addition to running a hotel, she will occasionally sell her body to make some money. When Maru tries to push her away, he inadvertently touches the girl's chest, causing him to have the feeling of grabbing and squeezing the girl's heart, just like how he killed the man-eaters. Startled, Maru quickly withdraws his hand, and then stops the girl from seducing him. The noise they make attracts Kiriko, who misunderstands that Maru is having an intimate interaction with the girl. As she comes over to check, her face instantly turns red. Maru doesn't know how to explain it, but feels very embarrassed. Fortunately, the girl explains it, clearing up the misunderstanding. She then reveals to the two that she is an orphan, and her dream is to run this hotel well, interact intimately with the guests she fancy by the way, slowly make money, and become a hotel tycoon. Kiriko and Maru then return to their room, where Maru finally gets the chance to tell Kiriko about the strange feelings he had when touching the girl, but neither of them can figure it out for the time being. The next morning, when the two are about to leave, they find that the girl is in sadness. It turns out that the man attacked by the beast yesterday has died. He is the boss of the nearby guards and has been taking good care of the girl. They don't know how to comfort this girl, as death happens so often in this world. Anyway, they feel sorry for her, influenced by the girl. Maru is in low spirits when leaving. To comfort him, Kiriko takes the initiative to hold Maru's hand. She wants to tell him that no matter what happens, at least she would be by his side. The two keep moving on, looking for the answers they want. During their adventure, they hear about the emergence of an organization called the Immortal Order, where there is a terrifying doctor who specializes in modifying human bodies. Kiriko speculates that she might be able to find information about the bearded doctor there. Maru and Kiriko arrive at the location of the Immortal Order showed on the map, but except for the quiet surroundings, they find no clues to the order. 
To attract its attention, they find a panel and write, offering services to kill man-eaters for 2 million yen per time. They wander around carrying this sign, and are finally noticed by the members of the Immortal Order. The members who have been hiding nearby inform a doctor of their discovery. Hearing this, the doctor suspends the operation, ordering them to bring back Maru and Kiriko. It seems the doctor is the leader of the Immortal Order. However, someone takes Maru and Kiriko away faster than the members of the Order. They are from an organization that opposes the Immortal Order, and when they see the sign saying they can kill the man-eaters, they want to pay for Kiriko to help with one thing. One year ago, a member of this organization went to seek medical treatment from the doctor of the Immortal Order. However, the doctor directly cut off her leg which was just slightly injured, and attached a mechanical leg to her. From then on, the organization has considered Immortal Order a bunch of monsters, and that's why they're opposed to it. It is also said that the Immortal Order has been performing horrific treatments until now, often replacing the bodies of the injured with machinery, and they even implant human brains into the body of robots. The member whose leg was replaced witnessed with her own eyes that a person was equipped with mechanical devices all over her body, and asked her for help in great pain. They believe the Immortal Order's behavior is against human ethics, and they've even heard that in the basement of the building where the Immortal Order headquarters locate, there are man-eaters they raised, which may have been used for human experiments. And they want Maru and Kiriko to help clean up these man-eaters. Learning of it, Kiriko quickly takes out a picture of the bearded doctor and asks them to confirm if this is the same doctor as the Immortal Order's, only to be told that the Immortal Order's doctor was a young man named Usami. Though disappointed, Kiriko still takes on the task, because she doesn't want those monsters to hurt humans. So she and Maru, under the cover of this group, enter into the basement of the building. Here they find many dormant man-eating monsters, and Maru quickly steps forward, activates his ability and kills them. As they search for more, Kiriko discovers a very large man-eater, like the leader of these monsters. Before they can try to eliminate it, the monster emits a strange blue light, and in the next second, many weird man-eaters appear nearby. It seems they just walk through the wall. Due to the sheer number of monsters, Maru and Kiriko are soon trapped by the monsters and unable to resist. Kiriko's body is gradually eaten by the monster. As she loses her physical strength and cannot breathe, she falls into darkness. Kiriko is desperate, but she suddenly feels that Maru is kissing her, which brings her back to her senses. It turns out that everything just now was an illusion, and Maru tries to calm her down when she falls into madness. As for why Maru did not fall into hallucinations, it may have something to do with his special ability. Maru kills the monster that hallucinated Kiriko just now, and just when they are embarrassed about the kiss, a man suddenly appears. He laughs strangely when he sees that Maru has the ability to kill monsters. Maru and Kiriko thought they encountered some pervert, only to see the man bow to them asking them to help kill another monster to save someone. This man turns out to be the young Dr. Usami. Usami takes Maru and Kiriko to his headquarters, where they are surprised to see nothing terrifying unlike what the organization of the anti-immortal order encountered before. Instead, there are a lot of injured humans, who have all undergone Usami's modification, and they have great respect for this doctor. After greeting the patients, Usami takes them to another room, where they see a wound-riddled girl, who can die at any time without the machines, and is unable to speak now. She turns out to be Usami's family, attacked by a man-eater a long time ago. When studying those monsters, Usami has found that if a human was bitten by a man-eating monster, he would be infected with a virus, which would cause the man to become a man-eater if the infected part is not removed in time. What's worse, even if it is removed, sooner or later the virus will onset again. That is to say, once you are bitten by a monster, you will definitely become a monster one day. To avoid the girl from becoming a man-eater in the end, Usami hopes Maru can kill her now, which is also her wish as she wants to die as a human. Hearing this, Kiriko and Maru are shocked. They finally get to know that Usami forcibly amputating people's injured parts is to prevent them from turning into a monster. Although the girl cannot speak, she can present what she wants to say through a tablet next to her. Her last wish is to take another look at the sky. A kind Kiriko is touched, and decides to help the girl fulfill her wish. This room is less than 10 meters from outside, so they can move both the girl and the machines that keep the girl alive slowly outside. Meanwhile, an accident occurs in the organization that goes against the Immortal Order. Their leader falls and her head hits the ground while protesting. Soon after she is sent back to rest, a bald man in charge of taking care of her announces that she has died, which is all because of the Immortal Order. Therefore, the bald man orders the members of the organization to launch an attack on the Immortal Order. As for the reason why he dares to attack, it is because he has just received news from his subordinates that all the monsters in the basement of the Immortal Order's headquarters died. The bald man describes the Immortal Order as a terrorist organization that imprisons humans for human experimentation. At his instigation, they launch a fierce attack on the Immortal Order. We have explained that the Immortal Order is actually not a terrorist organization. So after discovering the attack, people here begin to arrange for the injured to leave. Elsewhere, Maru and Kiriko, with the help of Usami, begin to move the machines slowly. After a while, they finally carry the girl outside the room. When the girl sees the sky again, tears well up in her eyes. Her last wish has been fulfilled, and she can finally die in peace. 
Maru closes his eyes, puts his hand on the girl's body, and the next moment he seems to pass through her body, reaching a red heart. Maru takes the heart in his hand and crushes it, ending the girl's life, just as everyone is grieved. Kiriko notices some text on the tablet. It was the girl's message to Usami in the last moments of her life. It says, thank you for everything you have done for me, and for helping me die as a human being. Thank you for giving me eyes, I love you. Seeing these words, Usami, who has always been calm, begins to cry loudly. The girl finally ended her painful life, but for Usami, he lost his only loved one in this world. Meanwhile, the bald man has led his subordinates to occupy the building, and it turns out that his purpose was not to resist the immortal order at all, but to occupy the machines and power generation equipment here. In this way, he can slowly build up his forces and become the king here. However, unbeknownst to him, there is still a man-eater in the basement of this building that has not been killed. As the girl's wish was fulfilled, Usami takes Maru and Kiriko, along with the girl's dead body to join the people who have escaped from the building. They have known about the attack, and Usami marks a location on the map, where there is a village. He asks these people to go and seek refugee there. Usami created the machines in the building to save his loved ones, and one day an injured man broke in by accident. He helped the injured man create a prosthesis, who brought more and more people to him for treatment. Gradually, the scale enlarged. As he reveals the past, Usami falls into a memory, where the girl was blind in both eyes at the time, until Usami gave one of his eyes to her, and that's why Usami has only one eye now. Suddenly, Usami carries the girl up to a building. Maru and Kiriko think he is trying to calm down, thus not bothering him. While waiting for Usami, Kiriko shows pictures of the bearded doctor and Robin to people nearby, hoping to get some clues. Luckily, she is told that Robin was Usami's assistant two years ago, helping Usami install prosthetic limbs for injured people. But then, he left for no reason. Anyway, Kiriko is thrilled to learn that Robin is still alive. Meanwhile, Usami is sitting on the rooftop with the girl in his arms. Her departure takes away his motivation to live. Looking at the girl lying in his arms, Usami kisses her forehead affectionately. Then he takes out a pistol and aims it at his head. Kiriko is still thinking about where to go to find Robin when a gunshot breaks the peace. They rush to the rooftop, only to see the dead Usami. Seeing this, Maru breaks down, thinking that his hands can only bring misfortune and death. If he didn't kill the girl, Usami wouldn't have died. Kiriko comforts Maru gently, telling him that his hands are meant to kill man-eaters to save humans, and not him but the crazy world should be blamed. As they bury the bodies of Usami and the girl, they find a special button on Usami's hand, the sign on which is identical to that of the special pistol in Kiriko's hand. Kiriko thinks the pistol may have something to do with the heaven they are looking for, so they decide to go to the town where Usami had lived before to see if they can find any clues. While looking for the town, they encounter a strange man, whose name is Juichi, and he specializes in selling some intelligence to make money. Leaving with no other choice, Kiriko pays and learns a few pieces of intelligence from Juichi. One of the stories is particularly bizarre. After the great disaster, a group of strong women who especially hated the world ruled by men, gathered to form a town ruled exclusively by women, and the men who came close would be killed. But, if they see any good-looking man, they would arrest him and make him a slave. Surprisingly, Juichi used to be a slave there, and because he was marked as slave number 11, others called him Juichi. Men there had no human rights and were treated like livestock, performing dirty manual work, and would be executed at will if they did not obey. Women could choose the man they liked to sleep with and reproduce. If a girl was born, she would be raised and educated by the women. However, if it was a baby boy, he would be directly thrown into slavery and eventually became the next generation of slaves. Juichi was picked by two women, and they formed a family. However, soon after, one of the women gave birth to a boy, unwilling to have their baby become a slave. The two women decide to take Juichi and the baby away from this town, only to be discovered by other residents. In the end, only Juichi managed to leave the town, while the two women became bodies hung outside of the town the next morning. However, Kiriko doubts the story. So she goes to Juichi and erases the mark on his hand, which is fake, indicating that the story just now is likely made up. Kiriko then takes out her pistol and points it at the crook ordering Juichi to drive his car. As Juichi moves the car away, they find a house plate, where was printed Takahara Academy with a logo the same as the sign on the button. Following the mark, Kiriko and Maru go to the second floor, where they find a leaflet from Takahara Academy. It turns out that Takahara Academy was an orphanage-like place, and its principal compared the society to hell, and conversely, the academy was heaven. In other words, Takahara Academy is likely to be the heaven they are looking for. It has two bases and 18 branches, and Kiriko decides to go to the locations of the two most critical bases according to the addresses on the flyer. Meanwhile, a major event occurs in heaven. Tokyo is discovered to be pregnant. At the moment they do not know who the father is. Before they carry out any solutions, they decide to lock up Tokyo first. From their conversation, we know that this school turns out to be the Takahara Academy that Kiriko and Maru are looking for. Back to Kiriko and Maru, they are stopped by Juichi when heading to the base of Takahara Academy. 
Juichi claims that the story he has just told was actually true, and then he reveals the number 11 tattoo on his shoulder. Maru checks it and confirms that the tattoo is real. After thinking for a while, Juichi finally decided to come back and ask for the help of the two. As he also noticed Kiriko's pistol, he thinks that maybe he can really save his child with this pistol. Kiriko and Maru are kind, agreeing to help Juichi determine if his child is still alive, so they get into Juichi's car and head to the town ruled by women. It's rather an abandoned school than a town. Maru and Kiriko soon find something abnormal. There are no humans here, so they speculate that the residents here may have shifted their bases. Gaining no more information, they plan to see if they can collect some supplies before leaving. Just then, an accident occurs. The temperature around them begins to drop off, and in a few seconds, the entire area is frozen. As they are about to freeze to death, Maru senses the presence of a man-eater above them. Kiriko fires a shot at the roof, and the next moment the temperature returns to normal. Soon after, they hear a voice nearby, and Kiriko runs to the sound, despite Maru's calling. This is the experience she has summed up in fighting man-eaters for so many years. As long as she knows how the man-eater attacks, it is no longer terrible for her. This man-eater's attack was ranged and could only freeze opponents in narrow places. Kiriko, after spotting the man-eater, fires a shot at it from a distance, blowing up half of its body. Kiriko then asks Maru to touch the half-body, but Maru doesn't find its core. In other words, the other half of the body that escaped is the main body of the man-eater. Ending the crisis, Kiriko tells Juichi the results of the investigation. They speculate that the man-eater just now probably killed all the people in the town. Just when they are desperate, they meet two men who had been slaves with Juichi. Under their narration, Juichi learns the truth about the disappearance of the town's residents. It turns out that after Juichi escaped, the town was invaded by a man-eater. The slaves were lucky enough to be woken up by the cry of the baby boy when the man-eater attacked, so they managed to run away. Now the slaves who escaped live in a nearby stronghold, and Juichi's child is still alive. Led by the two men, they come to the stronghold. When Juichi sees his child, he can't help but cry happily. A banquet is held at night to celebrate the return of Juichi. As for Maru and Kiriko, they decide to stay here overnight and leave tomorrow to find the base of Takahara Academy. Just as they are sleeping, the temperature around them begins to drop again, which wakes Kiriko up, and she immediately informs others to escape the house, and then rushes back to take the little boy despite her own safety. As she is trying to get out, she finds that the temperature keeps dropping. Just as Kiriko is about to freeze to death, Maru snatches the boy from Kiriko's hand and puts him on the ground. The next moment, the temperature around returns to normal. It turns out that it is not the man-eater but the boy that made the temperature drop. Maru tells Kiriko that he has just felt the breath of a man-eater from this boy. As he finishes his words, the boy cries from his sleep, and the temperature around him also returns to normal. The next morning, Kiriko tells Juichi the secret of the boy. Perhaps because Kiriko is so kind, instead of killing the boy, she asks Juichi to take good care of the child. In return, Juichi gives Kiriko and Maru his car. With a vehicle, Kiriko embarks on the path of looking for heaven. Shortly after Kiriko left, Juichi kills one of his companions in the stronghold and leaves with his child. It turns out that when Juichi was about to escape from the female-ruled town, it was this companion who snitched about his plan to the rulers, resulting in the death of the child's mother. Meanwhile, Tokyo in heaven sends a message to Kona when she is still imprisoned. The doctors in the lab tell Tokyo that when the item in her belly is taken out, she will be set free. A few days later, Tokyo was giving birth in the delivery room with the help of the doctors, and the process made her very painful, which should be the reason why Kona felt the pain. Soon, Tokyo's baby is put into the lab. After that, Saatari, the experimenter in charge of delivering the baby, has a secret conversation with the principal, and we can learn something from their talk. The kids here were created by Mina, the artificial intelligence, and they are not normal humans. The principal created these perfect-oriented children with the intention of transplanting brains into their bodies, so that she, and other humans in need can become immortal. Unfortunately, these seemingly perfect children will get a strange disease and die, and the experimenters have not yet discovered the cause. Now the principal is pinning her hopes on Tokyo's child, who may not get the strange disease. To have the brain transplant operation, the principal must wait until the children turn 15. But she is over 80 now, and perhaps she won't be able to live to that time. Therefore, she asks Saatari to transplant her brain into the young vice principal first. That way she has enough time to wait until the child grows up. Although Saatari is somewhat disgusted with the suggestion, he does not dare to disobey the order. Soon after, students receive a notice that a special test will be taken soon. Instead of revealing the content of the test, the robot tells the students that if they cannot get the answer, please follow their heart to choose the correct path to reach the outside world, which is their responsibility as Hiruko. The word Hiruko is the name of the man-eaters in the outside world. The children present have a strange feeling that although it is the first time they have heard the word, it seems to be their real name. As students in heaven are on their test, let's see what Kiriko and Maru are doing. After getting the car from Juichi, they advance much faster. Soon, following the broken map, they arrive at the vicinity of the base of Takahara Academy. 
At night, as they are going to bed, they notice a puff of smoke wafting out somewhere in the distance. After checking the map, they discover that it is from the base of Takahara Academy. Although they are curious, it is too dangerous to take action at night, and Kiriko decides to go check it during the day. At the same time, a major accident occurs in heaven. Today is supposed to be the time for the children to test, but it turns out that the machinery is invaded, and all the equipment runs out of control. Just as the staff of heaven falls into chaos, the barrier is suddenly broken, and the entire base seems to be attacked by something unknown. Fortunately, the children escape in time and are not injured. They are supposed to go back to their rooms to take refuge, but Mimiheim finds a hole in a nearby wall, which makes her have a strange idea to go outside and take a look. Some of the children are also influenced by Mimiheim and decide to go out with her. When they come outside, they are instantly stunned by the scenery. They have never seen such a vast world. While the kids are in shock, let's take a look at what's going on on Kiriko's side. As soon as dawn breaks, Kiriko and Maru set off for the base of Takahara Academy. On their way, they find a market in the vicinity, where many people sell goods and food. Maru is attracted by one of the food stalls. When he tries to buy food with paper money, the vendor tells him that paper money is not allowed here, and they use a kind of currency made of wood. Kiriko is surprised to learn that residents here can get the currency for free, and the organization that grants residency is called the Ministry of Reconstruction, which, according to what Robin told Kiriko, is a special organization that intended to revive human technology. Soon after, they arrive at the place where they can apply for resident status according to the guidance of the vendor. Following the process, they successfully receive their currency. Since they were required to take pictures during the process, Kiriko thinks she might be able to get some clues about Robin. So she takes out the picture and asks the staff here, and to her surprise, he indeed saw Robin, who turns out to be the leader in the neighborhood. After talking to Robin on the phone, Kiriko is asked to meet him in two hours at a place called Large Filtration Plant. Kiriko takes Maru to find a residence and drop off their luggage, and then hurries to the meeting place, while Maru stays in the room waiting for Kiriko to return. When Kiriko sees Robin again, she is moved to tears, Robin is also surprised. The two tell each other about their experiences over the years, and Kiriko recounts his consciousness in his sister's body, much to Robin's shock. However, he quickly calms down, revealing that he also found the bearded Doctor Strange, so he kept tracking the doctor but in the end lost him. By the time he returned, the orphanage had moved. Then he discovered this strange base, which seemed to be able to cultivate plants that could adapt to harsh environments. So he cleaned up the wasteland and planted some edible plants on it. The field he planted attracted many people, including those organized by the Ministry of Reconstruction. With the help of the organization, it quickly developed into a small town. The reason why it is called the Large Filtration Plant is that there is equipment that can not only filter water sources, but also generate electricity. Kiriko still has a lot to ask, but Robin tells her she should take a shower first and they can talk more when she feels clean and comfortable. While taking a shower, Kiriko can't help but think that since she has found Robin now, life will definitely get better in the future. When she walks out of the washroom, she finds that her clothes are missing. Just then, she hears Robin walking closer. Kiriko is unguarded against Robin, allowing the unexpected to happen. Robin actually handcuffs her and ties her up. Robin at this moment shows a perverted smile, and at Kiriko's horrified gaze, Robin pounces on her. Two days passed, but Kiriko didn't return. Maru realizes that Kiriko might be in danger, so he decides to go to the large filtration plant to find Kiriko. As soon as he reaches the gate, the guards stop him. Once they know Maru is here for Kiriko, they begin to laugh at him. For the two nights, they've been hearing some sounds from Robin's room, and they take Kiriko for Robin's lover. Hearing this, Maru is instantly enraged, and he knocks down the guards who stand in his way. Finding the room where Kiriko is trapped, Maru is surprised to see her being tied, and he soon figures out what has happened to her. At this moment, Maru sees Robin, and he turns his anger into power, punching Robin over and over again. Seeing that Robin is about to be killed by Maru, Kiriko breaks free and rushes to stop him. Although she hates Robin, she still hopes that Maru can spare his life. Maru, who always listens to Kiriko, finally leaves with her without a word. Kiriko cries and blames herself by the river. She thought Robin was a good person, but he turned out to be a scumbag. She blames herself for being too weak, and everything she has seen so far was fake. At this moment, Maru bravely pours out his heart. He thinks Kiriko is the best. She cooks, drives and takes care of him along the way, and everything they have experienced is real. He likes Kiriko, hoping that she will stay by his side in the future, and that he will protect her. Listening to Maru's confession, Kiriko throws herself into his arms crying. After that, Maru and Kiriko continue their adventure in search of heaven. Their relationship becomes closer at this moment. As Maru and Kiriko leave, the Ministry of Reconstruction discovers that Robin is missing and they subsequently investigate the large filtration plant. Here they find a room where the body of a monster is connected to a broken human body. They are so frightened that they quickly close the door, having no idea what Robin was doing there. Now let's take a look at the story of what happened in heaven. When the children of heaven discovered the outside world, 
they thought that this was the school's test for them, and decided to go to the forest to find clues. There are four of them out this time, including Mimi Hine, who is however frightened by everything strange outside. Therefore, she decides to return after walking for a while, accompanied by a boy Shiro who likes her. Strangely, they follow the same way back, but cannot find the location of the school. Just then, Mimi Haim falls into danger while searching for the school, and Shiro is injured when saving her. Mimi Haim doesn't understand why Shiro would rather be injured than protect himself. Shiro tells her that it is because of his love for her. Mimi Haim then removes a button from her clothes and gives it to him, which may be a ritual to establish intimacy between them. Meanwhile, the vice headmaster of heaven intends to return Tokyo's baby to her. It turns out that she has always known that the principal intends to use these children to create eternal bodies, but she does not want the children to be in danger. Therefore, she takes advantage of the heaven being invaded to flee here with the children. Here is a detail. Saatari has created an identical infant to study it, but because of the attack just now, Saatari can't tell which is Tokyo's child. Now that the situation is urgent, Saatari can only take a random one and gives it to Tokyo. He then tells Tokyo that it is her and Kona's child. Holding the baby, Tokyo feels a sense of intimacy. Just then, the injured principal suddenly appears and tries to snatch the baby, who is her hope for eternal life. When Tokyo realizes that she is in danger, many red tentacles suddenly emerge on her body, and then spread to the principal who is trying to take the child. A burst of white light flashes, accompanied by the scream of the principal. In the end, Mimi Haim and Shiro get on a yacht with other two children who walked out of heaven with them, and the yacht is heading to the bustling human city. The first season of this anime ends here. After watching the first season, I finally know that the story in heaven happened 15 years ago. It is revealed at the end of the story that at that time, disaster hadn't occurred in the outside world. Perhaps children in heaven encountered some crisis in the human city so their abilities were uncontrollably released, and that's why the man-eaters showed up in the outside world. What did these children do in the outside world? Why did this world collapse? Everything will only be revealed in the second season. If you also like this anime, please comment like in the comment section. The more comments I have, the faster I'll recap the second season. Well, today's video ends here. Bye.